I think uh, it's important to ask them, why did Marx start with an analysis of the commodity? Why was it not something else? Why did he not begin with uh, capital or wage labour or any of these other things that seem so important to capitalism? Well, I'd say that although commodities existed before capitalism, uh, it was to a very much limited degree. And uh, it's actually the production and exchange of commodities uh, which forms the basis of what Marx called the capitalist mode of production, i.e. capitalism. Now, Marx actually states in the opening sentence of Capital that wealth under capitalism appears as an immense collection of uh, commodities, with the individual commodity being its uh, elementary form. Now, I say, well, how true, how true is this today? You know, go into any uh, big supermarket like Asda and Tesco, you'll find tens of thousands of commodities uh, there on the shelves. And that's actually nothing. I looked at the figures, as of January this year, Amazon.com sold a total of 398 million commodities through its website. And that's, uh, <clears throat> that's mostly consumer goods. Think as well of all the raw materials, all the, uh, all the actual machines and so on that are sold around the world on the market. And we really are tr truly talking about an immense collection of commodities. So the commodity, therefore, is like the basic cell of capitalism. Uh, you need to be understand what a commodity is and also, crucially, what determines its value in order to be able to understand the rest of the functioning of the capitalist system. Now, so for all this talk of commodities, what actually are they? Well, if you look in the business press like the Financial Times uh, or in some kind of economics textbooks, you'll see reference to commodity markets. And by this, they're talking about exchange of things like uh, uh, coal, oil, wheat, steel, and things like this. And these are things that are really not finished goods, but uh, <coughs> are inputs into later production processes. Well, Marx's understanding of the commodity was actually much broader than this. Uh, it's not just unfinished goods. Uh, so forget what you've, what you've read in the business press or economics textbooks. Firstly, Marx points out that commodity must be a product of labour. Now, this can be a tangible good, something you can actually physically hold, whether it's like this book or the table. Uh, or it can be a service provided, such as a haircut, or if I was going to repair your car, for example. Now, so for all the talk about Marx not being relevant in Britain or advanced capitalist countries nowadays due to uh, the decline of heavy industry, I'll say that's not true. Commodity, like, uh, services are still produced and exchanged as commodities under capitalism. Note as well that it's not, it's not something that you would just uh, find for free uh, in nature. So it's not like uh, picking wild flowers from a meadow or blackberries from a park. It's, uh, it's the product of labour. Second and crucially, a commodity must be something that's produced for exchange. Uh, it's not produced to satisfy the needs of its own producer, uh, but to satisfy somebody else's needs. And that's really the distinguishing feature that separates commodities uh, from other forms of goods and services produced in uh, different modes of production. So, for example, if you take an early tribal society, they still had to produce items necessary for their own existence, things like clothing, tools, and shelter, and so on. But these things were socially produced, uh, with the total wealth belonging to the entire tribe. And uh, there was no need for the exchange of goods between individual members of the tribe, as uh, they would have all just simply taken what they needed out of that store of common wealth. Therefore, Marx notes that it's only the products of mutually independent acts of labour performed in isolation that can confront each other as commodities. Otherwise, there's no need to exchange them, if you can all take freely. So in order for commodity production to develop, it requires this emergence of uh, a division of labour in society. So rather than everybody in being involved in the joint production uh, of goods in a tribe, you, know, you get a specialisation. Some people become weavers, some people become cooks, some people become uh, blacksmiths, and so on and so on, with all the different tasks that society performs. Uh, you get this division of labour. Now that doesn't over, uh, happen overnight, but it takes a long uh, process of development, which I don't really have time to go into. However, although we've had commodity production in earlier forms of society, including slavery and feudalism, uh, it's only under <coughs> those, uh, that commodity production formed only a very small part of, uh, of the production of society. The vast majority of goods were produced either for personal consumption, uh, for example, in the case of peasant farmers who were produced for themselves and their own families, or they were directly appropriated by the ruling class themselves, so slave owners and feudal lords, uh, <coughs> without any exchange in return. It's only under capitalism that commodity produ production becomes generalised. Uh, the vast majority of goods and services are produced not for individual consumption, but for exchange on the market. <clears throat> so how then are we to understand the value of a commodity? Marx explains that commodities have a dual nature. 
And it makes a crucial distinction between, on the one hand, the use value of a commodity and its exchange value. Now, he notes that all commodities, uh, through their properties, must satisfy some kind of social need. Uh, they must be an object of utility. And in this sense, they're a use value. Uh, if they weren't useful, nobody would buy them. Uh, they would, you would find nobody to exchange them with. This, is, uh, this use value is based on the physical properties of the uh, object itself. So, for example, this table is useful because it is solid. You know, it can support lots of weight. It's stable. It holds things up. It doesn't fall over. Uh, alternatively, this T-shirt is useful because it has the property of being able to, to uh, retain heat and so on. It doesn't matter what kind of need that is satisfied or indeed how that need is satisfied. You know, Marx says it doesn't matter whether it's a need arising from the stomach, such as uh, the need for food to stop you starving, or from the imagination. So uh, as in a need that's not necessary to keep you alive, uh, but it can become a need. So take, for example, today uh, a mobile phone or luxury goods such as jewellery. You, know, you don't need it to, to stay alive, but it becomes a need in any uh, event. And this puts to bed these ideas that somehow Marx's economics uh, is not relevant today, as we're simply all sort of buying consumer goods that we don't really need. Well, Marx explained it doesn't matter. Needs can be created. And uh, you can see this in the trillions of pounds spent on advertising agencies to try and convince us that we need certain products, such as makeup or cigarettes or a razor with seven blades. Now, once commodity production is developed, you find that certain commodities exchange in certain definite ratios with one another. Uh, they have what Marx calls an exchange value. Now, Marx gives the, the example in capital uh, of a quantity of wheat exchanging for a certain quantity of iron, but uh, it could be any commodities at all whether it's tins of beans, loaves of breads, computers, cars, or anything else that's exchanged. Now, what is it that makes these commodities exchange in certain ratios with one another? Why is it that I would have to exchange three tins of baked beans for one loaf of bread, or 300 loaves of bread for one computer? Now, of course, we're exchanging different use values. Like, they all satisfy different needs in different ways. But it's not the usefulness of a thing that determines uh, why it exchanges in these certain defined ratios. You know, what makes a tin of beans useful? Primarily, it's its quality as a food. You know, it stops you from going hungry and starving. You might also consider things like its taste or its longevity. But why does it take three of them then to exchange for one loaf of bread? You know, is one loaf, of, one loaf of bread more or less useful? How would you quantify it? Some people may say, well, bread is tastier. Uh, others would disagree. It's subjective. Uh, but, you know, a tin of beans, okay, it lasts longer, but it could be, therefore be seen as more useful, but it's always cheaper than the loaf of bread. Why is that? But <clears throat> here we're talking about both beans and bread. They both ultimately satisfy the same need, i.e. To, to keep us fed. But what about the computer or the car? Now, it's obvious that their usefulness differs, uh, not quantifiably, uh, is and you can't measure usefulness objectively according to some kind of single scale. You can't, put, uh, you can't have a measuring device like a thermometer and put it against a commodity and then suddenly work out how, exactly how useful it is. The difference is, is uh, qualitative. Like it's because they satisfy, or it's because they have different qualities that they satisfy different needs. So what actually is it then that all commodities do have in common? Well, if you disregard the specific useful functions of, the, uh, of each of them, it's that they are all the products of human labor. So how can we compare them quantifiably by the very fact that different amounts of labor have gone into their production? Now, Marx wasn't the first to put forward the idea that labor is the source of value. As, Marx, uh, sorry, as Rob explained, the classical economists before him, such as Adam Smith and David Ricardo, also held to this view. But unlike them, Marx didn't look at value just from the point of view of the individual producer, such as the mason or the weaver, but he saw uh, <coughs> human labor is in the abstract, uh, i.e. society's labor in general. Now, as mentioned earlier, society characterized by commodity production is based on a division of labor. So different people perform different kinds of labor. You could be, for example, a carpenter, a mason, or a weaver, or whatever. And they all perform different concrete kinds of labor, joining, building, weaving, uh, to produce different kinds of use values, so to tables, houses, and cloth. But when considering exchange value, since we're abstracting away from the different uses uh, and considering commodities only from the view of their common social substance, i.e. labor, we also abstract away from them the different concrete kinds of labor that went into their production. So tables, houses, and cloth are no longer the products of carpenters, masons, and weavers, but of human labor in the abstract. <coughs> 
And this flows from the dual nature of the commodities. On the one hand, it has a use value because it, labor of a specific concrete kind has gone into it, giving it certain uh, physical qualities, but it has an exchange value uh, <coughs> since human labor in the abstract has gone into it. Note that when considering human labor in the abstract, we're reducing different kinds of labor involving different levels of skill down to a kind of simple average labor. And so more complex labor is simply considered as a, a different multiple of simple or unskilled labor. And simple average labor, Marx points out, isn't something that's fixed and eternal throughout all of uh, human history. Uh, but it varies between different countries and different cultural epochs. But if you consider it at one point of time, it is in society as given. Now, exchange value isn't something natural or inherent uh, uh, to the commodity. You, know, you can't dissect a commodity, you can't cut it apart and find its value in there. And, you, know, you can't look at it under a microscope and discover it. However, it does exist. So not, not as a physical property of the commodity itself, but as a social property. And this should be obvious when you consider that use values as, uh, such as clothes and tools have existed throughout human existence. But it's only under certain social conditions, a, cer a certain uh, mode of production, uh, you know, once they're exchanged as commodities, that they acquire an exchange value. So I, this is a social property of these commodities. How can we determine it then? Well, I said the clue is in the name. It's through the act of exchange that this value becomes apparent. However, it's not based on the single act of exchange, and nor is it determined by the labor of an isolated producer. So <clears throat> if, I, if I produce coats for a living, and I want to exchange uh, these coats with someone who produces shoes, that, that single act of exchange, that I swap a coat for a pair of shoes, uh, doesn't determine the value of coats and shoes in general. Under capitalism, where commodity exchange is universal and generalized, commodities are not exchanged between individuals, uh, but through the medium of the market. The actual producers and, com of, uh, and consumers of commodities rarely, uh, if in fact ever, actually meet each other in person. You don't get to ask uh, <coughs> the shopkeeper how much uh, labor was spent in the production of uh, commodities on the shelf. So you know, when you go into a shop like Tesco, uh, <coughs> you're confronted with many of the same commodities standing behind each other on the shelf, uh, whether it's vegetables, meat, clothes, or TVs. Therefore, the individual character of the actual specific labor that went into the production of each one of these items uh, is lost. So despite putting the name of a farmer on a packet of uh, carrots, all you really see is just a bunch of carrots of various uh, sizes and shapes, or t-shirts, or TVs. You don't know how exactly they were produced. So how then do we measure and compare the general abstract human labor that went into their production? It's simply by its duration. It's by the time uh, that it was spent in the production of these commodities. But note, since we're talking about exchange value, or rather from now on I'll simply call it value, uh, of a commodity, it's, it's not based on the actual individual labor that went into it, uh, <clears throat> but it's based on the amount of labor required to produce such a given commodity in general. And that's an important point, because the exchange value is uh, therefore determined not by the individual labor that went into it, but by the socially necessary labor time required in general to produce such a commodity. Marx notes that this is determined by the conditions of, pr of production which are uh, normal for a given society, including the average degree and skill of an, of, and intensity of labor uh, prevalent in that society, i.e. what we call the productivity of labor. As such, value is not something that's fixed and eternal to a, a commodity, but it changes uh, with time and place due to uh, certain historical and social conditions. So, for example, when you go into a shop, you don't ask or care about how much time went in producing uh, a particular article. All that matters, really, is the time required on average, given the normal conditions of production. So for ima imagine that you're uh, at a street market, and there is a, you know, a market stall with two boxes of peppers for sale. Uh, they're pretty much exactly the same peppers, but one was uh, offered for sale for double the price of the other. Now the seller says, well, uh, <coughs> these are more valuable since double the amount of time, unfortunately, went into their production. Unfortunately, we had a slower set of workers uh, picking them and harvesting them, so that's why I'm going to charge more. Well, uh, <coughs> of course, you would say, no thanks, I'm going to buy the cheaper ones, and the ones produced by these uh, slower workers are going to remain unsold. Hence, sellers on the market, which today is very much a global market, are forced to compete against this average level of skill, uh, technology, and organization found in their branch of industry. If they don't, they're going to be forced out of business. 
So nobody, nobody is uh, therefore calculating exactly how much labor went into the production of each commodity. You know, there's no one there from state trading standards at each stage in production with a stopwatch, you know, measuring the amount of time put into it. It's uh, through competition of the, uh, on the market uh, that forces commodities to be produced according to their socially necessary labor time. So capitalism therefore produces a drive to develop the productivity of labour. And we're going to consider this in much more detail in one of the later sessions today. But I think the important thing to understand now is that in doing so, uh, if labour is more productive, if we're able to produce a greater mass of use values in the same duration of time, uh, society becomes more wealthy. You know, we have more use values to go around. But at the same time, each individual commodity becomes less valuable in itself. Uh, it has a lower exchange value since less socially necessary labour time has gone into its production. So for an example of this, you had the development of the, the power loom uh, <coughs> a few, uh, centuries ago. Meant that in a 10 hour day, for example, uh, you were able to produce double the amount of cloth that can be, could be wo woven previously by hand using a hand loom. So if I take an arbitrary figure, you might get 100 square metres of cloth produced in a day rather than 50. Now society is clearly wealthier in the fact that in one day's labour you now have double the amount of cloth produced. Uh, you have more use values. Uh, but the actual exchange value produced in one day, like, as in the value, is still the same. It's still the product of one day's labour. Uh, however, the value that's now, that value is now spread across double the amount of cloth. So each square metre of cloth now represents half as much uh, value as before. So those using a handloom don't get to sell their cloth at the old rate, i.e. for double its uh, now current value, as that produced by a power loom. Now only half of their labour represents a socially necessary labour time required for the production of cloth. And this is really something that mainstream economists either don't understand or cannot explain, because they confuse use value and exchange value. They, they, because they think everything is determined by its utility, uh, how can something become less valuable but be just as useful? Now this leads us on to the question of price, which we mustn't confuse with, uh, with that of value or exchange value. And if you look at the prices of commodities, they fluctuate. Sometimes they're increasing, sometimes they decrease. And, if you, and also, at the same time, you can go into different shops and find different prices for exactly the same commodity. Does this mean that those specific commodities have different underlying values? I say no, price is only the monetary expression of value. And it fluctuates around its value according to the laws of supply and demand. So obviously if supply is short and demand is high, prices will increase above their values. If supply is high and demand is low, prices will decrease below their values. And this very mechanism of supply and demand produces a certain equilibrium. You can see prices oscillating around an average, uh, providing that the productivity of labour and other factors remain constant. And that average, when supply and demand therefore cancel each other out over a given period of time, is linked therefore to the underlying value of the commodities. This question of price is frequently used by capitalist econ economists to try and rubbish Marx's economics and say it's not, uh, it doesn't work. They say, well, what about things that no labour has gone into, like a virgin forest? How can that have a price? Well, Marx never denied that it's possible for things that are not the product of labour to actually be offered as sale, but, and, and, it, and therefore through their price they take on a commodity form. But it takes a certain development of society, uh, of private property rights, of commodity production and of money, uh, for all this uh, to even be possible. But once this is the case, all sorts of things can be offered for sale. For example, if you go back to the medieval period, the church used to actually sell what they called indulgences, and for a certain price, they would absolve you of any sin that you happen to commit. But I would say, if you take, uh, take, take commodity production as a whole, these sort of things are extremely rare and isolated, and, uh, and, and therefore kind of uh, an un unusual kind of uh, f like fringe element of, uh, of the economy. Likewise, how is it that certain items can fetch enormous sums of money, such as uh, works of art or fine wines, uh, which seem to have nothing to do with the amount of labour that actually went into their production? Well, it doesn't invalidate the labour theory of value. We have to be clear that here we're dealing with unique or extremely scarce items, and they can't be produced through the application of more labour. Uh, their price cannot be brought down through competition. As such, the demand can vastly outstrip the supply, leading to extremely high prices, i.e. monopoly prices. So Marx's labour theory of value, uh, the value of commodities is determined by the socially necessary labour time that goes into their production. Here we're dealing with commodities that can be produced or reproduced uh, without restrictions.
It must also be clear that when we're dealing with the labor theory of value, we're not dealing with isolated acts of exchange between individuals, such as at an art auction, but we're dealing with generalized commodity exchange over the course of the whole global market. Now, Marx spends a good deal of chapter one explaining the development of exchange value, how it in fact begins precisely with these isolated acts of exchange between individuals through the process of barter, where in fact the ratio of goods exchange can, can appear accidental, to all the way through to a general, a general form of exchange value, where through the acts of millions of exchanges uh, of commodities, the value of any one commodity uh, can be expressed in relation to all others. And this requires the development of money, which acts as a kind of universal equivalent a commodity that can be exchanged with all other commodities and therefore gives expression to their values. But with barter, the exact ratios that commodities exchanging can be more or less with each exchange, they appear accidental. But with the generalization of commodity exchange, each individual act of exchange loses its individual character and becomes one of thousands of exchanges on the markets. Therefore, these uh, ratios average out. They begin to confront buyers and sellers on the market as prices. And importantly, these are not of their choosing, uh, but uh, appear as established facts, you know, representing ultimately the socially necessary labor time that goes into their production, i.e. I their exchange value. Uh, for example, when you go into a supermarket, you don't haggle over the prices over, of the things that are on the shelves. Or even in areas of, uh, of the market where you might be expected to haggle, the price that you haggle around isn't arbitrary. In fact, you come to generally know the going rate of things. Now, Marx says, in the midst of the accidental and ever-fluctuating exchange re uh, relations between the products, the labour time socially necessary to produce them asserts itself as a regulative law of nature. Note, this law is not something that's timeless or imposed from without, but emerges from the interactions within. Once commodity exchange reaches a certain level of development, i.e. becomes generalised. Importantly, Marx explains how this law becomes mystified, i.e. how it becomes obscured. I, rather than understanding value as ultimately a social relation between people engaged in the, produ in the production of commodities as part of a division of labour, it appears upside down as a relationship between things, i.e. the commodities themselves. And this is what he refers to as commodity fetishism, fetish being an ethnographical term to describe how in early societies certain objects could become imbued with mystical properties, I, for example praying to uh, like an idol, like an, a carving of a god, in order to summon that god to make it rain. And you can see this in Christianity where people believe that certain relics, you know, bones of saints or supposed pieces of the cross, have uh, mystical powers. And once commodity exchange reaches a certain level of development, you have individual producers of commodities all bound together through the market. And despite their individual labor having a private character, they're in fact part of this social, labor of, uh, social division of labor of society mediated through the market. But it's only through exchanging their commodities that they discover whether their individual labor is in fact part of the total necessary labor of society. If it's not, then their commodities remain unsold. Therefore, in the minds of the producers, it's not this relationship between people that's evident. It's the relationship between the things they produce, the commodities, uh, are the things they're trying to sell. Commodities, therefore, seem to exchange due to some kind of mysterious characteristics of their own. They appear to develop a power over human beings. Their value appears as something that's intrinsic to them as use values, rather than because they're the products of human labor. So a coat, therefore, appears to have a certain value simply because it is a coat or a, a quantity of iron because it is a quantity of iron. Therefore, excuse the fact that they both represent amounts of congealed human uh, labor. And this is particularly reinforced with the emergence of money. It appears as if certain metals, such as silver and gold, or pieces of paper, possess, possess a magical power inherent within them, and that they can be exchanged with all other commodities. Now, commodity producers, therefore, appear to all be blindly chasing money, and it appears as if it has the mastery of, uh, over humanity. If you don't have money, then obviously you can't survive. But since production isn't consciously planned, the producer's own products confront them as an alien power on the market. If there's therefore a glut of commodities on the market, you can't sell your products. You'll sink. It's not within your control. And you can see this with an economic crisis. It confronts us as a blind force, throwing millions of people out of work, leading to widespread misery. Why? Because commodities cannot be sold in the market. It appears as if these commodities by themselves suddenly refuse to be sold, and that there's nothing that we can do about it. I'd say, Marx points out, it's only when you have a free association of people planning production uh, collectively, i.e. communism, that this uh, commodity fetishism will disappear. 
So instead of our relations being mediated through the exchange of commodities on the market, we can consciously begin to plan production collectively and distribute these things according to need. And this is really the fundamental point touched upon by Marx at the end of the chapter, namely that in uncovering the mystery of the commodity, uh, understanding exchange, relation, uh, exchange value as a social relation, it becomes clear that it hasn't always existed, but is specific to a certain relations of production, i.e. commodity production. So in understanding that this law of value has a history, it also has a beginning and, and undergoes a process of development. It's implicit that this, uh, this law isn't timeless. It's not a physical property of the commodities themselves, but it has a transitory character. And it's for this reason that Marx suggests that the various capitalist economists are unable to come to this conclusion, as to accept that commodity production is not fixed and eternal means to accept that capitalism is also a transitory system of production, and it means drawing revolutionary conclusions. So I'm out of time, and uh, so that's kind of a whistle-stop tour of chapter one. But I would say that this can all seem a bit abstract, and I say it's for that reason that this chapter can appear as one of the most difficult to get to grips with. But I would say it's vital to build up these concepts uh, that underpin the, the understanding of the system of the whole. Concepts such as what is a commodity, the dual nature of a commodity, its use value, its exchange value, the socially necessary labour time, price versus value, commodity fetishism and so on. These things are vital if we're to understand the more complicated concepts such as capital, surplus labour and profit that we'll consider throughout the rest of today. So I haven't had much time to elaborate on examples, but I think hopefully we've got plenty of time to go into much more detail in the discussion and I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you.